internet for a slightly delayed Friday extravaganza episode of The Rubin Report. And joining me today are, are two of my all-time faves. First up, author of As Goes California, My Mission to Rescue the Golden State and Save the Nation, my good buddy Larry Elder, and another good buddy, host of The Dr. Drew Show, Dr. Drew Pinsky. Guys, how are you? We're doing great. By the way, I, I was just sitting here thinking, I want to live, live Dave Rubin's life. Great kids, <laughs> great husband, the gene pool supporting the kids, the great state of Florida surrounds you. And I, 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 it's so, you, and you've nearly seduced me into coming down there. No, I'm, I'm staying in California, Drew. Somebody has to turn out the lights. I think sooner, <laughs> or, sooner or later, like a drug addict, they're going to hit rock bottom and begin to rethink. And I want to be here to, to watch that renaissance. All right, I'll Drew, be with you. Drew, you are married to a woman, and she's just fine, and we, we support that here at the Rubin Report. But actually, you both started exactly where I wanted to start before we get into any of the issues of the week. You guys are the holdovers. Larry, you tried to take out Newsom. I, I did everything I could, and then I got the hell out of there. Drew, every time I have you on, it's basically all we talk about. But, but just real quick, maybe 30 seconds each. I mean, you guys, Larry, you're, real, you're gonna stay and fight this thing. You're born and bred. You're, you're right. just gonna keep fighting. And you, do, you, do you believe there is reason for hope, I guess, is the question. I do. I'm born and raised here. I believe that the captain of the Titanic would have taken evasive action had he known there was iceberg ahead. It is my job, your job, Dr. Drew's job to inform people iceberg ahead. And I think common sense will prevail. The crime, the homelessness, the cost of living, the fact that we've lost a million people in the last three years, our schools are near the bottom, the average price of a home in California, twice that of a national average. At some point, people are going to say, I've had enough. And keep, Drew, uh, I suspect you're a little more amenable. Uh, to keep Larry's metaphor going, though, uh, unfortunately, we're throwing people into the life boats right now. And uh, my kids are amongst them. I'm encouraging them to get out of here. But I was driving through downtown on the 110 about two years ago, and I thought, my God, this, this state, this city is worth fighting for. And I, I committed to it, and that was during the sort of uh, recall of Governor Newsom, and I thought, we're going to do this. And the voters have disappointed me every time. And so I've lost faith in the voters here. So I'm always thinking about moving to be a neighbor of Dave Rubens, but I'm staying here in the meantime. Thank Let me you. just say this real quickly, Dr. Drew. Uh, Gavin Newsom's poll numbers are the worst of his career since he's been a uh, governor. And people cite two things. They cry crime and homelessness. So even Gavin Newsom is beginning to suffer polls. If this had happened two years earlier, three years earlier in 2021, when I ran, maybe I would have had a better shot. But I think even people in California have gotten to the point now where they're beginning to rethink some of their assumptions. And, and by the much. way, when Gavin wants to do something about homelessness, he can, because when yes. the president of China showed up in San Francisco, suddenly all the homeless people disappeared for a week. They're all back now. What they did with them that week, nobody knows. Uh, but we got, a, we got a good recap of the week for you. And I thought you guys would be perfect uh, for this first story particularly, because of course, Larry, you were uh, the, the wake up call for me many, many years ago, black conservative destroys white libtard, not that fun when you're the white libtard. And there's an, and, and Drew, you are an old school liberal, which is still what I consider myself, which for awesome. whatever reason puts us on the right these days, but there's a lot of liberals waking up. Uh, one of them right now is Stephen A. Smith, uh, and here he is, uh, ESPN, Stephen A. Smith, and here he is. He's really on the fence on kind of which way he's going. He seems to be breaking, uh, but talking about what's going on with the Democrats, Biden being compromised, that Kamala could be the follow-up, which is absolutely insane, but here we go. I think that he has damn near a cult following. I'm not calling folks cults or anything like that. I'm just talking, I'm just speaking metaphorically about how these folks are in terms of their love, their devotion, their belief in him. And they're not going anywhere. And then you got Hispanics who are supporting him now, according to the polls. You've got more black folks who are supporting him now, according to the polls. And even though they're swearing that the overturning of Roe v. Wade, along with some of the charges that have been executed against them, that that's going to turn off white women. Well, we ain't seeing that evidence. And so I'm looking at it from that standpoint. And I'm like, well, wait a minute now. Are y'all not paying attention? Because let me tell you something. Charlemagne the God said it best when he said Joe Biden is not inspiring at all. Um, you almost get the impression that the Democrats who are pushing for Joe Biden to get four more years, because that's what they were chanting at the State of the Union, just four more years, four more mm -hmm. years. The man's going to mm -hmm. be 82 in November and you, you chant for four more years. Yeah. But you've got progressive leftists on this side chanting for four more years. I don't know if they know how embarrassing that is. OK, OK, but that's neither here nor there. 
The point is, is that when you're doing that, I'm looking at them and I'm saying to myself, come on now, this is utterly ridiculous. You think this is going to get it done. But I tell you what I'm starting to suspect. They don't know if Joe's going to last four more years. And all they care about is that he gets through Election Day and the inauguration. And then after that, who's the next line in line? It's Kamala Harris. Drew, let me start with you here, because it seems to me that he, he's catching what I think most people believe. Maybe they're not saying publicly, but nobody really thinks Joe Biden's running the ship. And, and there's really nobody that honestly believes that four and a half years from now, he'd still be functional enough to be president. And yet they're pushing the guy. That's an awful lot of BS. It, well, I think people are saying it out loud. I, I, I hear it all the time. Uh, and it's it's not you don't have to be a neurologist to understand that there's been a significant decline just watch videos of him uh, on on inauguration day or back during the election versus now there's been a significant and it's not that he's old per se it's the, he's had a significant neurological decline and that can happen as people age either as part of aging or as part of a primary process some neurological neurodegenerative disorder now the question then becomes what are the limits of what we can tolerate in that office? And do you want somebody in there that may continue to deteriorate? It may not, too, by the way. He could be right here. He could stay right here. That's the way mm -hmm. it goes sometimes. But even that, I would argue, is a significant issue. You know, it's interesting. I, I love Stephen A. Smith. I love that guy. I've learned him back. I was a fan of his way back before anybody else. And I used to do his late night radio show and talking to him. He's so bright. It's like talking to a machine gun. He just comes comes at you with stuff. He's always thinking. And he brought something up here in, loosely, which has been troubling me, which is uh, President Biden keeps appealing for money and for support because he needs to finish his job. And I've never heard him say, what is this? What does that look like? What is the job he's mm -hmm. trying to do here? Completely destroy the country? What have, have no borders? What what is this job? What what are we talking about? That that to me gets sort of it feels eerily uncomfortable when he talks about finishing the job. Larry, what do you think finishing the job? What do you think uh, Joe <laughs> Biden means when he's saying finish the job? I'm not sure he knows which job he's talking about, but what what do you think it means in his mind? First First, I'll make a comment about uh, about Stephen A. Stephen A. had uh, had drinks uh, a few years ago uh, with his best friend from Philadelphia, uh, somebody I've known about 30 years, and he is uh, Stephen A.'s best friend. And I can tell you, Stephen A. is nobody's brain dead liberal. I believe that Stephen A. thinks the way we think. The, the, you mentioned him being on the fence, Dave. He's on the fence about how far out he wants to go without running the risk of losing many of his followers, without running the risk of him being perceived as an Uncle Tom or, mm -hmm. or a self. I can tell you, uh, he's common sense ago. He's been like that all the time. Now that he's become so successful, makes so much money, I think he feels more secure about venturing out and giving his opinion. But I'm not mm -hmm. sure people like that deserve a cookie for saying the kinds of things you and I and Dr. Drew have been saying for years. It is clear that Joe Biden is declining. It is clear that Kamala Harris is on deck. It's clear they cannot drop kick her in favor of some white dude without uh, taking off black females who love, love, love them from Kamala Harris. So when somebody like Bill Maher or Stephen A. Uh, makes some sort of commonsensical observation, uh, we always go, oh my God, even he feels that way. Again, I'm not quite sure they deserve a cookie for it, although I'm happy they finally arrived at what I consider to be commonsensical observations. Larry, that's why I love you, because I feel like you're just me on crack, because you basically, <laughs> I mean that with love, because you help my wake up, and, and you know, Drew, we talk about this all the time, I'm still always focused on these people waking up, because I want to get them there. Larry, you're like, forget the cookie, like, get there already, or that's it. But, but Drew, you know a lot of these people in L.A. Do you sure. think they will make the move? I mean, I, I, Larry, you're making a good point. He may finally be saying this now because he's financially comfortable enough to say it, or he sees the culture turning. But, Drew, you know plenty of these people. You think they're going to get there? Well, you know, it's interesting. I, I've not thought of it this way, but you know how they have these sort of deprogramming of cult members where they have a sudden rush of reality coming in. So when the change does come, it's going to be rather quickly. I, I, Bill Maher is a friend. I love him. He's a brilliant man. And he and I found common ground in exactly this area, the idea of critical thought. I, we were sort of recognized at each other. I was in New England. He was in the, in the mid-Atlantic in, in undergraduate uh, uh, liberal arts education during the mid-70s. 
and we 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 think we think we look at things we've shared ideas and he arrived because when you think critically you arrive at the same place every time he he arrives at these places now Bill, I think, has some Trump derangement, and that may be justified. I don't know. But in terms of critical thought, he's unassailable. And he's beginning to just take his time, get there, and defend it. But the people that are in this sort of indoctrinated state, the younger folks that have been in college before, once critical reasoning, critical thought, you know, gen really quality liberal arts education went away, they've been sort of brainwashed. And so when they sort of open up, when they start to think critically, it's going to be a rush in of, oh my goodness, I, I, reality is different than I thought. Larry, let me ask you another version of that, because did you happen to see Coleman Hughes on The View this week by chance? Can, did you, can, can, I, first, can I first say something about, about Bill Maher in response to what Dr. Drew just now said? Sure. Bill Maher used to have me on his shows all the time. He's never had me on his show on HBO because he came on my radio show one time and I asked him to please stop calling himself a libertarian. I said, you're not a libertarian. The only thing you're liberal on are drugs. You want the taxes raised. You want a minimum wage. You said you're going to vote for Ralph Nader for crying out loud. Most libertarians would rather vote for Rasputin than Ralph Nader. Stop calling yourself uh, a libertarian. And he stopped calling himself that, but he got angry at me. I saw him at a party and he said something kind of nasty to me. Now, one of the reasons, Dr. Drew, that, uh, that Bill Maher has awakened is because he knows they're coming for him next. He has been very politically incorrect. You're right, he's smart, he's funny. He made some very derogatory comments about Michelle Bachman, about uh, Sarah Palin. He referred to Sarah Palin's son, Trigg, as, as retarded. You can't say stuff like that uh, in our cancel culture. And he recognizes if he doesn't push back against the cancel culture, they're coming after him next. So as far as I'm concerned, many of the things that Bill Maher is saying are, are things that he's saying to protect himself and protect his career. Nothing wrong with that. Again, you get a cookie for this? I don't think so. And and I, by the way, I I I thought I was libertarian too until I met a real libertarian. And uh, and then when you meet a real libertarian, I, the, the two thing two things I wanted to solve problems, and the libertarian said to me, "By who? The government? What you want the government to solve problems?" That oh okay. And then I realized she didn't have a heart, so I thought oh, I have a heart, so I can't be libertarian. Well, Larry, let, let, let me ask you one other thing related to this national security, uh, and most libertarians want completely open borders. Uh, and numbers matter, culture matters. So uh, I, I'm a small L libertarian. I've never been a capital L libertarian, but I, but I hear you, Dr. Drew. I really do. Larry, real quick on, on this Coleman Hughes appearance on The View this week. He went on, he, he laid out a real destruction of the woke. They, they treated him very poorly, all of them ganging up on him. But there was an interesting moment, to your point, where he basically said, well, he'll vote for a Republican, but not Trump. And it seems to me that's the person you're most frustrated with, and I fully get that, because it's okay, you're gonna attack the woke, disassemble the woke, and then you're gonna vote for the same people that they're gonna vote for. Well, Coleman Hughes is a very, very bright young man. Uh, he gets it. Uh, I, I'm a Trump fan. When I dropped out of my campaign, I was in Mar-a-Lago with Donald Trump and promised that I would support him. I said, but please talk about what I think is the number one domestic problem in America that virtually nobody's talking about, which is the epidemic of fatherlessness. 70% of black kids enter the world without a father in the home, married to the mother, often 25% back in 65, now 25% of white kids do. And when you're raised without a father, you're five times more likely to be poor and commit crime nine times we're likely to drop out of school, and 20 times we're likely to end up in jail. What's happened in the mid-60s, a good Democrat named Lyndon Johnson launched what he called the War on Poverty, and since then we've incentivized women to marry the government and incentivized men to abandon their financial and moral responsibility. When Republicans talk about it, they'll be accused of being racist or somehow dissing the heroic job that uh, single moms have been doing to raise boys and girls by themselves, or if you're black, you'll be called an Uncle Tom, so nobody talks about it. So to that point, let me show you one other clip of Stephen A. because he, he starts discussing what's going on with, uh, well, mothers, fathers, and raising people that maybe will eventually vote the right way. The issues that we have with immigration right now, mm -hmm. oh, my mother and father be like, get you behind the back of the line. Mm -hmm. Like, we had to. Who do you think you are? You know I mean, that's how folks act. Law enforcement, during the whole social justice movement, and you saw riots in the streets and stuff like that, throwing up your hands to a police officer. My mother, my father would have looked at me and said, I hope they whipped your ass. <laughs> my mother would have been like, if they throw you in jail, I won't even come to Respect. visit you. She's like, the law is the law. You obey the law. Because of that, I would tell you, Democrat at the polls, but conservative at home. I don't say Republican. Conservative, my mom, yes. You think today, today, that's different then yes. versus today. A lot of weird things have happened the last, you know, uh, for four decades 
You think your mom today would vote conservative or yes. you think she would vote conservative? Wouldn't think about voting Democrat today. Wouldn't um, think about um, it because she would believe that the left is, you know, being held hostage by the progressive left, that the centrist that's in them that long but was right. believed to have existed from the 60s to the 90s, etc., has evaporated. And there is no way that my mom would have supported today's Democrat. Larry, I'll give you this one first because I think you can do it quickly. But it's basically welcome to the party, pal, right? That's right. Again, all of which I've been saying for 30 some odd years on my radio show. And I know that Stephen A. read my book called Stupid Black Men uh, because he came on my radio show and discussed it and talked about how it opened his eyes about the Democratic Party being the party of slavery, the party of Jim Crow, the party that founded the KKK, the party of the Southern Manifesto, the party that opposes school choice. And so all I'm saying is one more time, welcome to the party. I'm happy that Stephen A's audience, he's very influential, will be hearing this stuff. But it's stuff that you, uh, Dr. Drew, and I have been talking about for a very, very long period of time. Yeah. And, uh, you know, are you guys familiar with Rob Henderson? He's a, mm -hmm. uh, uh, yeah, so Rob's an Oxford trained social psychologist, and he has coined a term luxury beliefs. Yeah. He's a guy that came from destroyed family systems in the center of California here. Uh, was a problem, engaged in criminal activity, got into the military, got his stuff together, went on the GI Bill to Yale, got his philosophy degree at Yale, and then went to Oxford. Uh, and now he's a brilliant thinker. I suggest you all follow him and look him up. But he coined the term luxury beliefs. He realized that uh, that that wealthy people in positions of uh, privilege were the ones that had opinions about families that caused his families to be destroyed, all the while they maintained their families yeah. multi generation upon generation. And of course, history teaches, there's no doubt about this. The same family's been under attack for reasons that are unclear. We have to stop that. Family education, something Adam Kroll has been saying for years, believe it or not. We, we bring up footage of him from 15 years ago saying family and education. We have to focus on that. And he was assailed for it. All right, we got a couple other things we're going to get to, but I think, Drew, you're going to appreciate our sponsor today, TWC Health. Guys, are you struggling to get a good night's sleep? You're not alone. Millions of Americans face an epidemic of sleeplessness that is silently harming their health and well-being, and millions of Americans are parents, which means they're not sleeping nearly as much as they should be. So when they lay down at night knowing that they have something to ensure a deep and regenerative sleep, it's life-changing. But before you reach for the melatonin, you should know that there are mountains of research revealing the many risks of melatonin. It's actually been banned from over-the-counter sales in many countries, but not North America. From disrupting, wait, the prompter's going a little slow, gotta go run with me here. From disrupting sleep cycles to increasing tolerance and dependency over time, if you're in need of a sleep supplement, melatonin is not it. Enter Restful Sleep Formula, crafted by awake doctors who understand the harms of melatonin, like Dr. Peter McCullough and his chief medical board at the Wellness Company. Restful Sleep Formula is an all-natural alternative to melatonin, packed with, packed with ashwagandha, kava, chamomile, passionflower, and more. This powerful capsule has everything you need for a deep, rejuvenating sleep. And here's the kicker. With Restful Sleep Formula, you actually save 56% compared to buying each one of these supplements separately. Plus, you save an extra 15% and get free shipping when you use code RUBIN at checkout. Don't just re dream of better sleep. Make it a reality. Visit twc.health slash RUBIN today and use code RUBIN at checkout. And now back to me. Okay, so there's, a, there's another weird story uh, happening right now involving Sean P. Diddy. I guess at one time he was Puff Daddy Combs uh, out of the, the town that you guys live in. Let's take a look. The rapper and music executive perhaps being linked to a sex trafficking investigation. He got some shots of a few people coming out of the home. Those people have been detained. Now we're trying to still connect the dots. We do have some sources on scene here that we're getting this information from. We were actually the first ones here with about different law enforcement vehicles at least. There are three Bearcats on scene here. This just all unfolded, Sandra, I would say less than 10 minutes ago. We got here even before the crime scene tape came up. Larry, I don't have great insight to exactly what's going on here other than every time someone has sent me this story or texting or tweeting about it, everyone's like, oh yeah, this is like this was known or something. Uh, what, what is going on here? 
Well, I have the same reaction that you have. You know, he's innocent until proven guilty. There have been allegations for a very long period of time. I can say this. I feel the same way that I felt when Paul McCartney got busted at an airplane uh, airport for taking in marijuana. You're that wealthy. You need to have somebody. Don't you have somebody taking your own stuff? <laughs> When Pop Daddy, he's a billionaire, isn't he? Do you really have to have to force yourself on 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 women to get them to do what you want them to do? Really, you're a billionaire. It just seems to me that that uh, what's the point of being a billionaire if you can't have your way? You got to force yourself on somebody. That's my reaction to it. I just don't know. Allegations come, they go. Uh, Kevin Spacey had all sorts of salacious allegations against him. It turned out he was not guilty. So I want to let this play out. I just don't understand how very wealthy people like that put themselves in this position. Yeah, so, well, I'm glad you brought that up because these are allegations, obviously, and until there's some proof, it, that is worth noting. Uh, Drew, putting that aside for a moment, um, mm -hmm. there does seem to be an awful lot of this weirdness in the celebrity class. Is that fair to say? This weirdness. There's weirdness in all classes. <laughs> there's weirdness amongst <laughs> humans. That These are people living their lives in the public, and they don't... The, the main thing that they that allows people in celebrity with money to progress to places where people ask questions about what, what's going on here is because they don't have the usual constraints that the rest of us have. They have money and they don't have an employer necessarily saying, pulling them into the office going, hey, you gotta get your, your crap together here, you're gonna lose your job. Or family or a circle of friends, they just dismiss people that who try to contain them. And so they have the power to continue to progress to the point where it gets kind of astonishing. That That's the big issue. But I, I got to uh, pile on to what Larry said. Anything in the media, don't believe it. I'm telling you, it's just a particular, have them write a story about you one time. You'll find yeah. how far they are from the truth. So first thing I think when I see that is, <laughs> I, I don't know what's going on, but whatever these people are saying, I don't believe it, number one. Number two, if the feds are raiding your home, I feel bad for you. I, I I don't know what that's all about. Uh, all of a sudden, the federal government is is a a military operation against domestic citizens. I, what what's going on here? And then I'm listening. Let take, give me the facts. Let that this thing play out. Like Larry said, I just saw a thing today just before we got on the air here, where there's they're they're going after sort of a the complaint. I don't know if this is real or not. Again, I'm sitting in whatever I see and read. I has to be. I have to confirm it but that they're going for a tax play. It's not like Al Capone thing. And you read the, and you read the complaint, it says, well, this sex trafficking ring, he didn't, re he didn't register with the federal government for tax purposes. It doesn't say anything about the legality of the sex ring. It just says he didn't, literally, you didn't establish the sex ring properly with the federal government for tax purposes. Now, Dr. Drew uh, and, uh, uh, and Dave, I don't really know, but I heard a rumor that they were looking for some papers by Joe Biden. I could be wrong, <laughs> completely, completely wrong about that. Clever, Larry, clever. I'll just give you one quick update on this and then we can move on. Because I think you're both right, actually. Until there's evidence or anything else, you're right. With how, how, how out of whack the government is with almost everything these days and the media, it's like, it's hard, it's hard to know what's going on here. Both yeah. of them. It's both of the things you cannot trust right now. All right. So, so just one quick follow-up on this. This is from Colin Rugg, who's an actual journalist. Uh, rapper P. Diddy's private jet has been tracked to the Caribbean islands after his homes were raided in relation to a sex trafficking investigation. The jet appeared to land on Antigua in the Caribbean, according to flight tracking data. At the moment, it is unknown if Diddy is actually on the plane or not. TMZ is reporting that the jet currently ground that the jet is currently grounded on Antigua. The plane is currently grounded there, although the flight data has yet to update and register him as officially landed. In any case, it's definitely Diddy's jet, no question. They reported Diddy's LA and Miami homes were raided on Monday in relation to a federal investigation into sex trafficking, narcotics, as well as firearms. So I guess really the reason I wanted to do this because I'm with you guys. We cannot be chasing allegations and everything else is because when you think about everything as it relates to Epstein. And that, you know, Giselle is in jail, Epstein is d dead, supposedly, but none of the people who committed the crime, we don't even know any of their names. I suppose that is the weird thing, right, Larry? Well, I, I guess. Also, uh, P. Diddy has a jet. Uh, uh, Jay-Z is a billionaire. Tiger Woods is a billionaire. LeBron James is a billionaire. Michael Jackson's a billionaire. Michael Jordan's a billionaire. Isn't it amazing, all these billionaires in a country that remains systemically racist? How does that happen? Listen, only in America could a young black boy become an old white woman. That's the Michael Jackson story. Oh, brutal. 
<laughs> uh, I, all right, you know we're gonna we had one more video on this, but I think I think we made the point, so we'll skip over to something else happening uh, politically at the moment because the the wild story out of politics was that Ronna McDaniel, who seemingly nobody liked, uh, but Trump backed her a couple times, but the base hated her. I was at the Miami debate where she basically got booed before the debate even began. Uh, she's overhead the party that has lost a whole bunch of elections. Uh, she steps down from the RNC. She becomes an NBC News correspondent and summarily is fired within about 24 hours. Here's a compilation of people over at MSNBC responding to her being hired in the first place. I'll be joined by former RNC chair Rhonda McDaniel in her first interview since stepping down as party chair. In full disclosure to our viewers, this interview was scheduled weeks before it was announced that McDaniel would become a paid NBC News contributor. This will be a news interview, and I was not involved in her hiring. I think our bosses owe you an apology for putting you in this situation. And look, there's a reason why there's a lot of journalists at NBC News uncomfortable with this, because many of our professional dealings with the RNC over the last six years have been met with gaslighting, mm. have been met with character assassination. We weren't asked our opinion of the hiring, but if we were, we would have strongly objected to it. NBC News, either wittingly or unwittingly, is teaching election deniers that what they can do stretches well beyond appearing on our air in interviews to peddle lies about the sanctity and integrity of our elections, but that they can do that as one of us, as badge-carrying employees of NBC News. There is an easy way to avoid the controversy NBC News has stumbled into. Don't hire anyone close to the crimes. She literally backed an illegal scheme to steal an election in the state of Michigan. That is the type of experience that Ronna McDaniel brings to the table. And that experience does not get us to a deeper understanding of anything in the public debate. I want to associate myself with all my colleagues, both at MSNBC and at NBC News, who, who have voiced loud and principled objections to our company putting on the payroll someone who hasn't just attacked us as journalists, um, but someone who is part of an ongoing project to get rid of our system of government. Well, what happened to Ronna McDaniel after about 24 hours of employment? Headline from the Daily Wire, NBC releases statement announcing Ronna McDaniel is out days, just days after hiring. Uh, Drew, am I cynical to think that perhaps NBC News hired her to do exactly this? They hired her to then have all their hosts go after her and then somehow come off as, oh, see, we are the good guys. Look how wonderfully principled we are. Uh, irony notwithstanding that Jen Psaki was working for the administration, the current administration, just a few months ago, and Rachel Maddow has lied about everything, including COVID and election denial, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah, it, it gets a little weird when you think about it that way, doesn't it? But I, I don't think this was something they planned. I think they planned to bring her into the conversations and have it happen live on the air. And I think that would have been good business. That would have been a very interesting way mm -hmm. for them to to go forward, to, to bring, they, they clearly need to bring some dialogue into their studio because the perception is so myopic and so skewed and so narrow. And by the way, the other thing it is that, which really jumped out at me, the woman with the sort of the auburn hair, uh, sort of with the Jennifer Aniston haircut, she was smiling and seething through her teeth. That seething quality is something I see only on one side. And I don't know what, why the, the unregulated hostility, that's what makes things so difficult to have discourse about when the other person is literally seething. That has no place in discourse or in journalism. Larry, is there a weird thing here? Because you've been a political outsider your whole life, especially in that crazy uh, country that you live in over there in California, um, where the Republicans who get on to MSNBC or CNN, they purposely only hire the ones who are pets. And Rana is, in many ways, she was a perfect pet for them because she hasn't accomplished anything, and yet she wasn't even good enough for them. You know, the most interesting thing about that montage, Drew uh, and Dave, is that Chuck Todd referred to the people who work at MSNBC as journalists, <laughs> which he could have named names. These are yeah. the same 
of us who had no problem uh, with Al Sharpton. Al Sharpton is the nation's leading anti-Semite race card hustler. He became famous by falsely accusing a white man of raping Tawana Brawley, has mm -hmm. not apologized for it. In the in the thick of the Crown Heights riots that one Jewish leader in New York called the most serious pogrom in the history of America. Uh, in the middle of uh, Freddie Fashion Mart uh, uh, fire uh, and homicide that resulted in eight people dying because of uh, Al Sharpton's rhetoric. Uh, and he is on a videotape agreeing to sell cocaine to an undercover FBI narc. Uh, he was $5 million light in taxes, according to the New York Times. And fast forward, he is what I think MSNBC hates the most, an election denier. He said after <laughs> Donald Trump won in 2016, quote, there's no question that Donald Trump is illegitimate, end of quote. That's verbatim quote. That's not a problem. One man's election denier is another man's uh, MSNBC TV host, I guess. <laughs> Drew, can you, Drew, can you give me a psychological makeup of these types of people that do what Larry just said? So they kind of lie about everything or they're the ones that cheat on their taxes or cheat on their wives or all of the stuff. And then they get up there and, you know, purport that everyone else is the bad guy. That really does seem to be what the, what sits under the political part of this. All right, so I'm going to frame this by saying I don't know these people personally, and for your guys that you're behind your control booth there, when you cut this thing up, please put this disclaimer in there with me. So I don't too much trouble. Don't put it. I don't, but, but we have had a narcissistic turn in this country. I watch it happen in real time working in a psychiatric hospital for 30 years, and people with these cluster B personality traits and disorders – have moved from wreaking havoc on the legal system to becoming a part of the legal system to being positions of authority in media and government now. And the the one thing that you can count on when people have a narcissistic band, we, we've all kind of moved that direction. It's just the way we have moved uh, for whatever reason. It's all of us have some of this. But if you have a lot of it, the one thing you can guarantee is when somebody says you are, what they actually mean is I am. Mm -hmm. So projection projection is the order of the day if somebody is accusing you of something look hard at what they're doing and i can the, it's uncanny how often it's the case that they're actually engaged in the very same behavior and by the way you're not you may not even be engaged in that behavior but they project it onto you it's things that they disavow about themselves that they put onto you well, you just beautifully yeah, yeah, gave yeah. me the most perfect segue ever. Wait, Larry, before I let you jump in, it was just so perfect what Drew handed me there because let's watch Joy <laughs> Reid and Rachel Maddow celebrate the firing of Ronna McDaniel. Our chairman of the of the NBC Universal News Group, Cesar Conde, uh, who we both know very well, um, he sent a memo that we all got as employees here uh, rescinding the hiring of Ronna Romney McDaniel. And I know I felt very strongly about it. I know you felt very strongly about it. I think everyone from 4 o'clock on, from Nicole all the way to midnight, we all felt very strongly and said so on our respective shows uh, yesterday. And I, I just have to say, when somebody does the right thing, I feel like it should be acknowledged as publicly as we acknowledged our outrage. And so I, I know how I feel about it. I am grateful to Caesar for actually making the right decision. I think it was the right decision, but I want to get your take as well. Oh, well, thank you for asking me about it. I, I still feel like I still I still feel like a little it, it always feels wrong to talk about things, you know, in the company Agreed. as if it's news. And, I, you know, it's just this. It's yeah. not the way either you or I are, are wired, all. I know. But I. I will just say that journalists are a fractious bunch. And in our big company with all sorts of different journalistic entities, you have all sorts of different people working in this business, doing all sorts of different kinds of work. And to see the essentially unanimous feeling among all the journalists in this building That's and all it. the sort of senior staff and all the producers and everybody in this building about this was one thing. But then to see the executives and the leadership hear that and respond to it and be willing to change course based on it, based on their respect for us and hearing what we argued, I, I have deep respect for that. Larry, putting aside the cultural appropriation of Joy Reid's hairstyle, it's very, <laughs> it's very ballsy that she's grateful to the guy who pays her check. Lethal. Two, two things. Morning Joe Scarborough uh, said that after uh, Ron McDaniel got hired, he would not have her on his show. Morning Joe was in Congress as a Republican. He introduced a resolution condemning his colleague, Al Sharpton. 
mentioning that Al Sharpton said if the Jews want to pin their yarmulkes on their heads and come over to my house and get it on, talked about how Al Sharpton referred to uh, whites moving into Harlem as interlopers, uh, Orthodox Jews as diamond merchants, and now he's licking uh, uh, Al Sharpton all over the place when he has him on his show. Regarding Joy Reid, Joy Reid in 2006, circa 2006, had a blog in which she mm -hmm. condemned homosexuality. She trashed the movie uh, Blo uh, uh, Brokeback Mountain and said she hated the idea of watching two gays kiss. When she became a host on MSNBC, all these things surfaced, and she lied and said she didn't uh, write them. She had been hacked. NBC hired a uh, expert to to, uh, to look into that allegation. Found out the expert said that they she was not hacked. Joy Reid actually wrote those things. Joy Reid cried, apologized. Some more things surfaced. She again said she had been hacked. So honestly, and but Ron McDaniel, who's going to bring a different perspective regarding the 2020 election, regarding Donald Trump, she's she's crossed the red line. We can't have her. But Al Sharpton, not a problem. Joy Reid, not a problem. It is absolutely insane. And you know what? There's another thing hidden in what they were saying. Uh, um, Rachel Maddow kept saying. They responded to our feelings and what we, you know, <laughs> it's like, yeah, the, the, was, you had a bad feeling. And then she said something about argument. I, I did not hear an argument. I did not hear any argument. I did not hear what Rona had done. I'd like to know. I'm, I'm fascinated. I'd like to see her come in and defend herself. We've lost argumentation completely. Arguments don't, that we just aren't having argumentation. We are having ad hominem attacks and we're talking about our feelings. Has no role here. Are we supposed to ignore what Pennsylvania did in changing rules and regulations regarding 2020? Are we supposed to ignore the 51 so-called intelligence officials who signed a letter claiming the Hunter Biden laptop story uh, was rushed in disinformation? Are we supposed to ignore the $419.5 million that Zuckerberg spent getting out of Democrat turnover? Are we supposed to ignore the things that happened in Wisconsin, Michigan, and other places? And that makes uh, Donald Trump an election denier when Hillary, for four years, referred to Donald Trump as illegitimate, said the election had been stolen, even though Jay Johnson testified, Obama's DHS secretary, Russians failed to change a single vote tally, yet two-thirds, 66 percent of Democrats believe that Donald Trump won because, quote, the Russians changed vote tallies, close quote. By long way of saying, more Democrats feel that 2016 was stolen than we feel that way about 2020, but we're election deniers and they're not. Larry, yes, you're supposed to ignore it. Yes. Larry, <laughs> yes, whether, whether I see you in person or on the show, my takeaway is always I'll have what he's having. So <laughs> it, it was great to see both of you. Uh, we're going to wrap up now because, Drew, you're live in just moments. Ask Dr. Drew Live is live pretty much everywhere. No, that no, you can... no, I, have, I actually have a meeting I have to do, but oh. uh, yeah, thank you for saying so. But ask Dr. Drew is on Rumble, so check it out on Rumble. So subscribe there. And uh, my friends, the, the, the wellness channel where I am, the wellness uh, company where I am the chief patient officer, uh, check that website out. Dave was mentioning it earlier. And remember, and started, ladies and gentlemen, it, and, and I started a little show. It's on Twitter. It's on where you get your podcast. So be sure and check it out. Also on YouTube, Larry Elder, Sage or Larry Elder, we've got a country to save. And remember, guys, if you see Drew or Larry on the street, be nice to them because they live in Los Angeles and they need a hug. I thank you guys as always. Have a great weekend. And we got a post game show coming up in about 30 seconds at rubinreport.locals.com. Ciao.